Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good evening uh, to Brian. Good snooze, I guess. Uh, welcome to everyone that is online right now. Um, for those of you that are online, um, we're going to spend the next hour live going through uh, images that you guys have submitted, as always. Uh, hopefully, with your um, input, your your questions, your comments, your challenges, uh, your disagreements even, that could be fun. Um, but we're going to spend the next hour editing in Capture One, which is that logo there. That being a raw editor made by a team of very clever developers out in Copenhagen in Denmark. So Capture One allows us to take our images that the cap or that the camera captures. The raw data from that allows us to process it and hopefully turn out something that's uh, even better, um, more aligned. It's, it's actually a thing that we, we deal with quite a lot on workshops. You know, how do I make the image look like I saw? Um, well, one of the, the ways is we use a raw editor to get it back to what you saw. Bearing in mind, you see with your brain, not just your eyes. So everyone's interpreting scenes differently, and that's what the editors are about. So uh, for those of you that are familiar, um, normal stuff, fire exits are here, here and here, blah, blah, blah. Um, we'll run through some quick birth, deaths and marriages and announcements to begin with. So the first one, um, there are a lot of live streams coming up uh, on Capture One's channel, not just mine. So Capture One are, well, as, as some of you will know, because um, we've been talking about this in the Facebook group for a little while. Uh, Capture One and I are off to the Midwest while well, starting in Chicago, and then we're heading even further west um, across the mountains. But before that, this Thursday, so if you look at the top left one, uh, we're going to run through a Color Editor Masterclass with uh, David Grover from Capture One. Uh, it's going to touch on things like the basic Color Editor, um, how to use the Advanced Color Editor, and, funnily enough, even the Skin Tone tool, um, and the Skin Tone tool being... A weird name for something that we use in landscape photography, but we use it a lot. So we'll cover that um, in that uh, that session on Thursday. So for those of you that want to know when those live streams are, if you look in the description of this video, just down there somewhere, click on description, you'll see a link. This is the first link that's in the description. That will take you to Capture One's page, which has always been there. Um, and actually, we'll cover that in a second. But there you'll find the upcoming live streams and how you join them. Now, I mentioned we're off on a bit of a trip. So from next week, uh, David and I are off <laughs> on, it's called it's officially um, Grover and Reefer's Midwest Quest is how they've titled it. Uh, I fed it into AI and AI gave me a very different view on what it should be called. So there's our movie poster, kind of cool. There's David as a cowboy. But more importantly, we're going to be spending uh, about, I think it's about 10 days, covering everything actually from um, rooftop shoots, so cityscapes, to reflection shoots um, across pools. We're gonna be covering mountains, we're gonna be covering lakes, we're gonna be covering heli shoots, um, weather permitting. Uh, so all that stuff in between, and we're gonna involve certain members of the audience of this. So we're gonna drop in and pay a visit to Brian, um, plus um, some other stuff along the way. Now, some of that is gonna be about editing, as we go. Some of it is going to be about actual photography, um, the art of capturing it. Some of it's going to be about, in general, um, even behaviours in national parks and things like that. So we're going to cover the whole realm um, of that while we're out there at live, as well as, um, obviously, we'll, we'll do some catch-up stuff when we get back. Um, but all of that stuff, so this stuff and the, um, the, the broader sort of live stream stuff, people have been asking, how do I get... Um, access, I guess, or, or heads up to some of the live streams. So for us on this channel, um, if you hit the thingy down there, the subscribey little button, um, that doesn't quite do enough. You need to go into that and click on the little bell thing and it will tell you when we launch a live. For Capture One, funnily enough, there's a whole learning hub. Um, so if you go to, as I say, the link that's down below or on Capture One's website, you will see a list of all their upcoming live streams. And here's a fun one. In the resource hub, which is um, part of Capture One itself, so most most of you have probably turned this off, but when you go into Capture One at the moment, you will see a little advert come up for the next live stream, which is the mastering color. Um, so we'll go into that in a second in Capture One, but if you want to know when this stuff happens, either subscribe to this stuff or go to the Capture One webpage, where you'll find that list over there, or go to um, your learning hub within 
um, capture one, and I'll show you how to get there in a second. Okay, uh, next question we've had from people. How do I upload files? Very simple. We talk about this at the end of every live stream, but I'm conscious that people stop by the end. So you go to that web address, that one. And in there, you will find a tool that allows you to upload your raw file. So if you want us to have a look at your files because you're struggling or you've got questions or you want to have a, a bit of an insight into a tool, upload your raw file and your name. Name's really important. Without it, you're not going to be on. Um, but please include your name, what you're trying to do, and the original files. We can then edit them on the next series or next session. Masterclasses, really quickly. So if, again, there's a link down in the description. So if you want to learn in depth about color grading and how to create your own styles with color or night cityscapes or capturing night sky or planning shoots or all the other stuff, um, you'll find that link down below. And finally, before we go into Capture One, make sure you're up to date. So if you are on a subscription with Capture One, you are entitled to be on the latest version of Capture One at all times. That's what you're paying for. It's not a free update, it's what you paid for, so use it. Um, so when you go into Capture One, if you go to the About screen, if it does not say 16.2.2, in that screen up there, um, then you are not on the latest version. So that applies if you subscribe. If you are a perpetual user or perpetual license user, still up until I think end of September, um, you are entitled to upgrades if you bought version 23 or 16 um, prior to February, I think it was, um, you're entitled to those upgrades. For those that purchased after February or for those that purchased from now on, um, you buy the version that you uh, that you purchased and you'll get minor updates but you won't get major ones um, so if you're subscribing it's included if you're a perpetual user license or holder if you're on a previous version you will definitely need to upgrade if you want to be on the current version we're running today if you're on 16 um, then if you bought it's very complicated isn't it if you bought prior to february then you are entitled to be on the latest version that's included in your purchase of your license if you bought after February, then that does not get included. Um, so major um, releases to version 16, you may find that you top out, um, at which point you've got the option to upgrade to a newer version or not. Life's about choices. Uh, speaking of choices, fun one. It's 4th of July today. So happy 4th of July to every American person, but I'm confused. If every other date that America uses is backwards, why is every marketing thing that I'm getting from an American company saying 4th of July? Surely it should say July the 4th. I'm confused. Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> Capture one. Let's go in. Uh, so this is that screen that I was talking about, funnily enough. Uh, the the resource hub, as it's called, in Capture One. Now, many of us know this not as the resource hub, but we know it as the startup screen. And a lot of us have ticked this little box down here saying, do not show at startup because it gets annoying every time. I hear you. The challenge is that quite often, Capture One puts stuff in here that's quite useful, um, and links, and updates, and what's new, and whether there's a new version, and so on. So if you did disable it, go to Help. You can't quite see the Help menu, but it's up there, and it's in there, Resource Hub. So Resource Hub itself is literally a, a, a nice fun, or fancy name for startup screen, um, but it actually has more than just the startup slash screen. It's got obviously all this other stuff in there too. So capture one and use that resource hub, as it were, to announce stuff. So if you want to know what's going on, maybe just check it out once a month, even that. Um, but I know, I'm, and I have, I, I've turned this off because it gets annoying. But when you turn it off, unfortunately, it does mean that you do potentially miss out on some announcements. So there we go. Right. Um, Bob, we'll start with Bob's picture. Uh, really nice picture of some mountains up in Scotland. We like Scotland. Scotland's got some very cool mountains, especially when they're nice and green and you can see them, which isn't always the case up there. Um, now, Bob's question was about black and white conversion. So using a new technique to um, convert to black and white and what were my thoughts on it, etc., etc. So let's, I guess let's start off with a new variant. So I'm going to start off with the raw image up here. So this is the actual image um, that came that came out of the camera, as it were. And this is exactly what we're talking about. So we can edit that image to be what we remember seeing or what, what we had in our minds. Um, and in this case, Bob's gone for a little bit more green, a little bit more saturation in there. 
more of a panoramic view and I, I sort of get that you know um, to a certain extent this extra sky up here isn't really helping so you know cropping down I, I think maybe it's cropped down a little bit too much we'll, we'll look at that in a second but these are all choices or design choices almost if you want um, that you can make with any image now we are going to touch on the black and white stuff in a minute but first off on the color um, I just want to cover a couple of things that I'd sort of um, screamed at me when it was loaded up so I'm going to make a clone of Bob's version. So here, I'm just going to label it as red so I know how to do it. That labeling of red, by the way, lots of people use the mouse. So we can go to, uh, where are we? Move down there, rating and color tag. Um, so if I go down here, I can change my rating or I can change my color tag. Oh, it's behind my head. So that's not going to really help you guys, is it? Uh, can you see it there? Yeah, rating, color tag, and it's flown off the screen. Um, but basically, we can choose red, yellow, orange, green, blue, pink, and so on. Or I can use my shortcut keys on my keyboard. So divide, star, minus, and plus, and so on. And we can assign them different colors based on that. So I'm putting a minus on there, which my keyboard has as red. So I know that this is the one I'm editing. This is Bob's original. Now, there are a couple of issues that I can see on here. So number one, the headroom. Um, and we, we talk about this quite, quite often with people, actually. We need to give landscapes space. Um, if, if it's going to be tight, make it tight. Make it fill the frame. Make it you know full screen. Um, let's, let's really focus on the mountain or the rocks or the texture. But if we're looking for a vista, it's got to feel like we've given it some breath, some, some movement, some, some space. So I'd be in a place of, I want to give it a bit more headroom up here, to be honest. And at the moment, this crop of one by two, it works. But I can't help thinking that a two by three crop might give us a little bit more of that space just to give it some room to breathe. And if I look at here, this now feels quite claustrophobic in comparison to here. I don't think it needs to be the full four by three you know, the original um, uh, crop. But this does help give it just a little bit more um, room to breathe just above that mountain. Next thing, um, the saturation up here on this um, this sun here. I'm going to go before and after. So before and after is a tool up on your menu up here or on your toolbar. If it's not there, uh, you can press the Y button on your keyboard or go to Customize Toolbar. And you'll see it's here and we can drag it up just like that. And then I've got my tool back. So I can see the raw image and the after, raw to after. And if we go in here to the sun, we can see this is blown out highlight. So we can actually look at, and I think you can see this on, on YouTube. I hope you can. Um, whereas we had subtlety here in the clouds, here it's gone extreme. Um, and it's really, really blown out those highlights. And it's gone probably way too um, yellow we've got a bit too much saturation on there so overall that just makes this top corner quite painful almost to look at because of those values so in here there's a couple of things i want to do first i'm going to look at the icc profile and the curve that was used because these curves you can see are their fuji film simulations because this was shot on a fuji camera but they each one plays with the curves a little bit um, so even though we're calling it a raw image it's actually not because it's a raw image that is based on the raw data and then a fuji film simulation put over the top and some of those film simulations unfortunately push things too far now that's the film simulation if i get a linear response or even film standard with a bit of brightness recovery don't get me wrong but i get a much smoother calmer gradient to these colors so if i look from there to there look at the difference now yes we're losing some brightness over here but ooh, have we frozen capture one again interesting hold on there we go no one told me we'd frozen capture one Oof. Um, there's something weird going on there. I need to talk to Mr. Grover about it. <laughs> if something weird's going on with, with his version of this software, but um, not with Capture One, with the, the broadcast software, but for some reason, uh, Capture One goes a bit funny. Um, so 
what I was what I was actually trying to show you is here in our curve, we've got all these choices here, which is Fuji um, film simulations, and they deliver a different result. But linear response here, off, on, off. That's the film simulation, the Fuji Astia. Back to linear response, and we can see that brightness has toned down for sure because the curve is flatter. But more importantly, look at all this detail up here. And it's that detail that we want to protect. Now, if we want to protect it even more, so let's just look at whether we've got some layers on here. So there's some layers over here, brightness layer and a brightness darken layer. There's a sky layer and we've got basically a background layer. Now that sky layer, let's have a little look at this curve here. And we can see, so not only is it on the RGB curve, which means that that's pushing any colors as well as any luminosity, but up here we're actually maxing out those highlights. So where there was a highlight in here, let's just get rid of that before and after, this curve here is pushing them even more. So if I were to turn this off temporarily, so that's without and that's with without with so not only do we have a film simulation pushing it to go brighter and more harsh and, and, and more saturated we also then have a curve that bob's built into here which then pushes the highlights even brighter and also lifts some of the the shadow now lifting the shadow not a bad idea but lifting these brightness areas up here is actually damaging that sky so i'd be really careful with the curve here if you've got areas and if you turn on your exposure warning you'll see if you've got areas that are, are getting near to clipping in an image, I'd be really careful around that top end of that curve because anything you do up there in terms of pushing it brighter is going to potentially um, bust it out. Now, using the RGB version also then pushes the saturation up, so maybe it would have been safer a little bit on a, a Luma curve, but to all intents and purposes, this is now fine. What I would consider doing on that sky layer, and I just want to check... On our background layer, we've got a lifting of black. Again, another curve. So we've got all these mid-tone curves on background and sky and, and so on that builds. Um, so with that said, if we do have our sky layer, which ironically actually excludes some of these bright bits, so I think that was possibly done with either Magic Brush or a Luma range. I'm going to do this then, therefore, on the background layer so that gets everything. And I'm going to pull our highlights down. Now, not that much. I just want to show you the detail that the camera's got. So we go from there, well, pretty much. That's actually the detail the camera has. So we want somewhere in between. So maybe there, and maybe we pull down white a little bit, which is a very targeted, specific part of the histogram, the very brightest part of the histogram, we bring it in. Now, the result of doing that, let's have a look. There's before, so that's Bob's version. And here's our version now. Everything's got flatter, softer, and we'll, we'll have a look at that next. So a question, uh, a couple of questions. So, uh, Michael, is it a problem if you push values to 255 if there are no details? Is it better for printing to keep it below? So if there are no details, so in other words, if it's blown, if you're at 255, you're going to be leaving the paper white, effectively, if you print. If it was, let's say, imaginary uh, 282, because it was so blown it was over. If it's over and you try and bring it down to 255, all that happens is we just end up with flat grey because it's trying to recover something that's not there. There's no detail. You don't gain anything. Um, personally, I would always ideally target to keep it just below, but there are some cases where that doesn't make sense. If you've got a sun flare and we're pointing into the sun or a street light and you're pointing into that light, of course the light's going to be 255. In fact, it's probably about 500 in, in real terms if you would look at it. Um, so you're not able always to get everything in an image below 255. But remember that as far as a printer is concerned, as far as your screen is concerned, the second something hits 255, overall, that means it's blown out, it's completely white, there's no detail in it. If one of the channels hits 255, it means that channel, so red, green, or blue, is completely maxed out it doesn't mean that it's overexposed so you could have a sky with 255 on blue and then a little bit less on green and red and actually it looks okay it's just the blue is completely saturated so you've got to read the image but ideally yes you want to keep the values um, within there when we're trying to capture we're trying to capture things as bright as possible without clipping 
um, and that's what that, that warning's for. Jeff, is a histogram showing the actual raw or after the profile? So your histogram up here is showing you result. Down here is showing you native um, data that's come in from the camera. If I were to change our profile, uh, let me just add the curve tool onto this screen so we can see. So if I change, our base characteristics curve that is affecting the curve tools histogram because effectively we can't once that base characteristic is set that's our baseline our baseline actually changes and this is why we call it a base characteristic that film simulation in the case of fuji or you know base curve for us um outside of fuji that's physically changing the actual histogram which is then our baseline for that image this curve here does sorry does not change in the way that the histogram does up here so your histogram and your curve is based on the raw data plus the icc profile effectively plus the base curve the base characteristic curve here that's what forms this curve this sorry this histogram within the curve tool this is your true raw histogram and things that i do so if i went to uh let's go brightness so watch this histogram here, uh, brightness maximum. That's going to affect in here, and it's going to affect up here in terms of that histogram, but this is what you're manipulating. So this is your, if you do nothing to this picture, this is what you're manipulating. If you start playing with it, you're also shifting that histogram, if that makes sense. So at a raw sense, if I, let me just go a different way. Let's clone that variant. I'm going to reset everything. So this is out of the camera here. If I go to our base characteristics and change this to uh, classic negative, right? This curve, sorry, the histogram, I keep calling it curve, the histogram within the curve sits exactly on the point of raw data plus, well, your your base characteristics, your ICC profile, plus your curve, which in Fuji's case is film simulations. Outside of Fuji is a curve that Capture One builds in. Um, so I just need to demo that, actually. Let me just show you. If I change this, for example, to a, a phase one, um, just put on that. Uh, it's not going to let me do it <laughs> because it's already built in. Carla, sorry, I'm going to pick on your picture. Um, if I change this on Carlos from a Sony, we've got the standard four film curves, or sorry, base curves. These are altering your starting point for your histogram. Everything you then do from that point, you're changing. Now, the curve itself, the curve tool, you won't necessarily see huge amounts of difference. Let me just go into Bob's image here. So if we start playing with the curve, you'll notice that the curve tool, and this is why I'm getting my tongue tied between curve and histogram, the curve tool will affect your histogram up here, but not your histogram here. Why? Because I need this as a reference. I need to keep this as a reference for what I'm changing in the curve. So this always reflects effectively that raw data when it comes to manipulating the curve itself. Otherwise, each time I moved one of these lines, the curve would change and I start Sorry, the histogram would change, and I'd start chasing it, which would get very confusing. Um, so, yes, it, it, the, the histogram that you see is a compound of those base characteristics on top of the raw data. If I change the curve, the histogram won't change. If I change other tools, then it reacts. That's probably an easy way of saying it. <laughs> um, right. So... On Bob's image, let's go back to our background layer. We've got this other curve adjustment in there. We've done some highlight recovery. We've got the sky back a little bit, but it's lacking some punch, right? It's lacking a little bit of, of just sort of boom, I guess, in, in the middle. So there's two ways that we're going to add some of that. The first is with a clarity layer. I can't type today. That's cool. So... With our clarity layer, I'm going to... Ooh, should we risk a magic brush? Let's give it a go. Um, so up our tolerance a little bit. And I'm just going to add, hopefully, 
a little mask over our mountains. Yeah, pretty good. Little bit over there, little bit over here. That's looking pretty nice. I pressed Option and M or Alt and M to get a grayscale mask so I can basically see more. And I'm going to right click on here and go to Refine Mask. And that's going to smooth that mask out. I don't want it that much. Maybe there, about 200. Apply. That makes the mask a lot less jagged at the edges. It makes the fall off a lot softer. So I don't notice that I've got something masked. With that mask, we're going to go down to Clarity. And we're going to press that button up. So we're going to push it up quite a way. And the default, remember, is natural. I would always recommend natural as a base starting point for clarity. But if we want to punch this in terms of getting color, we can use literally punch as a method. And if I change that to punch, you'll notice that it's gone a bit more saturated. So punch is effectively, interestingly enough, the neutral clarity um, or version, we've got a, there's a pro tips thing on this on YouTube. So have a look on the channel that covers all four of these, but it's neutral plus an addition of allowing saturation to change with that clarity. But what that means is we go from there to there, which gives us literally that punch back of the mountains. Now it's kind of similar to where we got to with here, a little bit off. So let's go back to our background and I'm just going to use a very basic saturation change. I mean, Bob's already done to 20. I'm going to push it a couple more points to there. The next way we're going to get, um, I guess, more focus on this mountain up here is I'm going to draw a gradient layer and we're going to call this one sky grad. Start from there. It doesn't have to be completely um, straight. And I'm intentionally coming down the mountain a little bit because I want some of this effect to go on there. So with that, I'm going to up our clarity in a natural sense, and I'm going to pull down our exposure. And remember, because of that gradient, it's going to affect the sky more here, 50% here, no percent. So pull down our exposure just a touch. And let's pull down our highlights quite a lot. And we could actually even play with a Luma curve here. So we can say, Leave the highlights now where they were, leave the shadows where they were, but that mid-tone, just drop that mid-tone down. So you see what's happening with the clouds at the top. So we go from there, quite flat, to here, where we get a bit more menacing, kind of cool. If we really want this mountain to pop, I mean, it is in a bit of a, a bit of mist, but let's just uh, do one more final one. So mountain, and we'll use again, let's use Magic Brush, because it did a pretty good job. I'm going to turn on our mask. Turn on your mask, press M on the keyboard. If you want to turn it off, press M again. Option and M gives you a grayscale mask. But I'm just going to add into there and there and there and there. And I've just added effectively a nice section of mountain there. But I'm now going to erase, not with the magic eraser, the normal eraser. Nice big brush, low opacity. Because with each click, I want to take away a little bit of this mask down here. So I'm focusing the mask on that mountain that we want to really, really stand out in the distance. So now if I go to my grayscale mask, we can see I'm just effectively, I'm leaving little bits of it. So there's, there's traces, but it's effectively all up there. If I right click and go to refine, we can soften that again a little bit more. So apply that. And then with that mountain specifically, because this sits in the mid-tones, or the, the lower mid-tones, but look at my little orange bar along here on our histogram. This is all sort of middle ground. That's where clarity likes to play. So I can punch that quite a lot if I wanted to actually use punch. Remember, this is over the top of your existing clarity layer as well. So don't overdo it. But you know, a natural one will get away with there. We can add a little bit of contrast as well, if we want to. We can add a touch of brightness. So we get to there. Maybe a touch of saturation into it. But then we get to this sort of view. And then personally, it's personal taste, nothing else. Um, so you, you guys work out whether you like this or not. I would put a little vignette into this shot. Not a huge amount. A third of a stop is plenty. Just to bring it back into there. Now, there was Bob's original in color. We'll come back to that in a second. That's the version that I would get to. That was what the camera saw. So it's a bit of a, 
it's a taste one, but I would be careful, Bob, in, in these bits, especially where it's um, really bright. If you're pushing curves at the highlights and all that sort of stuff, you're going to lose. Oh, look at all this detail, all that all that stuff up here. It's all missing. Um, and that's what I'd want to see more of in this shot and give it some breathing room. Uh, Barry, you see some images with crushed blacks in the shadows. Would you use Luma Mask and reduce exposure or the Curves tool? It depends why the blacks are crushed. Um, so if they're crushed because they're underexposed, then if you want them, then leave them as they are. Chances are, if you try and pull up a completely crushed black, you're probably just going to pull up noise, um, which doesn't help you. If you're trying to crush blacks, um, and this is probably not the best example to do it on, but let's um, let's do it. So crushed, sh ooh, crushed. Across shadows. So we've got some in here. There's a little um, spike there of shadow. Um, all I'd do is go onto the Luma curve or Luma um, tool and I would probably drop oops, that. Of course, I didn't actually place a mask on there, did I? That was silly. Uh, let's fill the mask on that layer. So now I have a mask. Oh, do I not have a mask? just do a filled adjustment layer. Crushed. Right. I can just pull this along and I can keep the other tones where they were by putting an anchor point there um, in the curve. So I'll just get rid of Barry's comment off the screen so you can see. So we've got an anchor point there, an anchor point here, but now I can crush whatever's in those shadows to be way under and way underexposed if that's a look that you want. Not everyone does, and that's okay. If you want to do it a little bit simpler, just go into your levels tool. Um, if I pull this along here, it's going to crush them. But bear in mind, this is linear. So as I move the shadows, it's also going to move the mid-tone. So everything in the image starts to shift. Whereas if I do it in the curve tool, in a Luma curve especially, I can anchor and say, do not change anything beyond this point here. And then just crush those very darkest shadows. I think that answers your question, Barry, but um, if it doesn't, just re-ask it. We'll, we'll get back to you. Um, but we're not going to do that to that image. Um, we'll leave it there. Now, going back to the very beginning about black and white conversion. So Bob has done some conversions on here into black and white. Um, there are a couple of challenges with the conversion. Um, and weirdly... Capture One's done that weird thing again. Sorry about that, guys. We need to work out. <sighs> we need to work out what's going on. What we need is this person um, to, to have a look. Um, we'll have a chat with him later. Um, so this is a black and white conversion. Um, it's a a conversion um, out of the color one. There are different ways of doing that conversion, but the typical way is you go into your color tab, and at the bottom you've got enable black and white. Now, you've also got these filters, effectively. It's no different to using filters on a black and white, uh, well, to capture black and white in, in reality. We can control different channels coming in, so how bright or dark the reds are, how bright or dark the greens are, and so on. Now, with a very neutral way of doing it, you just get whatever came, or came out of the, the image. I would be in a place of wanting to play with those. So let's just do a standard black and white conversion. And let's think about what was in that image. So the greens, do we want them darker? Do we want them lighter in the mountain? The yellows, do we want them lighter or do we want them darker? And the yellows are the bit that's giving us light in this image. So that gives us some, some ability to differentiate stuff. Now I could take the blues, for example, and darken them down. And that's not just if we have a look here. Some of this looks pretty blue, but also some of this in the sky does. We could then take the cyans, which is more of the sky, and we could take that down. Uh, magentas, do we have any? Not really, it's not doing much. Reds, yeah, some of that foreground is starting to get affected. So do we want the foreground lighter, or do we want it darker? And that's where these dials really come in, because we can start to sculpt the black and white conversion to match the colors that we've got to play with within the scene and how we want them to appear. So I then go from there to there but this is all then personal taste and personal flavor um, and to answer Carla's question um, do you prefer starting in the color editor or looking at the black and white styles um, I prefer personally 
slightly different to the answer to the question. It's not a case of a standard style. There's one particular style that everyone has built in. Um, and I don't know whether it was intentional. <laughs> but under your built-in styles, you have... You used to have... <laughs> I haven't been in here for a little while. Um, we used to have the IQ styles, as it was called. Um, that's interesting. I need to port them across. If you... <laughs> If you had a pre... I think if they've had a clear out. Oh, my God, they've had a clear out. Um, there used to be, in built-in styles, um, the old IQ, so the phase one, um, digital back styles. Um, now, whether that's been converted into this black and white soft or black and white punch, I don't know. Um, but this is live on air, new news to me, because it's disappeared. Um, <laughs> cool. Cool. Um, I would always start with the IQ black and white styles and you could go for a neutral or you could go for effectively a high contrast one. I believe that's probably what they've done with black and white punch, for example. Um, but yeah, interesting. It's um, mm, okay. We'll look at that later. So if I were to apply one of the, as it is now, styles um, onto the base edit. So I've already got my color edit. Remember, this was already done in color. I now apply the black and white layer. Um, and it's not actually a layer because it sort of sits it sits on the background. It's a, a style that's applied to that. Um, we're in a place where we can now tweak again that color. So this has a black and white enabled, but it's to a profile that's built into Capture One. So I can still play with these colors. I can still increase the brightness of what was yellow there. I can still pull down the sky and the rocks with that blue. We can, and black and white is very forgiving with this. Um, don't push it too much, but if you did have the need um, within black and white, you can push clarity quite a way up. Be careful with clarity on black and white. So if I go to Bob's conversion here, what you'll see around here is some sort of haloing around these uh, these areas of contrast that typically comes from clarity on a black and white conversion so you want it to be nice and crisp nice and sharp you don't want to be seeing um, the sort of glow um, it's a bit of a giveaway that some clarity has been used on it but I'd be in a place of playing with the drama of it so absolutely go to your color editor and there's remember there's two things one how the black and white conversion reacts to color so yellow is brighter, green is brighter. We could actually lift those blues up to get some of this back up and so on. But this is based on what's underneath the black and white conversion. So if I go to my color editor and say anything that's green is now going to be more yellow, that will also affect, you saw that tiny little change on that right hand side of the mountain. It also affects things there. If you were to change the reds and say, well, all the reds are going to become orange, that will affect the foreground. If I change the blues and make them more saturated or darker, then, of course, everything that I'm doing behind the scenes, not black and white, is then being further manipulated by those color sensitivity sliders in the black and white tool. So don't forget, you're, you're playing with two things. You're playing with the input into the black and white tool, which is all of your other tools, so your white balance, your color balance, your color editor, all of that stuff. And then over the top, if you imagine it that way, you're then taking the black and white tool, saying convert everything to black and white and manipulate these channels by making them brighter or darker, depending on how bright they are. Um, Rick, do you ever go back and do a specialized re-edit of a color image underlying the black and white conversion precisely to enhance the effects of the various black and white conversion sliders? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is, is the short answer, which is sort of where I was, I was mentioning there. Um, yes, because, and, and actually just to prove the point, let's turn off the black and white um, in here. So I'm just going to move that off the screen. So here is my image. Here is what I did to the version that's underlying the black and white version. I don't think that's a very nice image necessarily. It's a bit overdone. We've got some challenges up here with, you know, some some... Uh, color splits and, and other stuff that's going on but it works for the black and white because I'm then taking those changes I made to the color layer and applying then the black and white filters over the top so to Rick's question yeah quite often if you're going to do a black and white conversion 
the underlying color image may need to change to a way that it doesn't necessarily work as a color image in the same way. Um, so you've just got to, yeah, just be aware of that stuff. Um, you could end up with two images. That's that's the key bit. And if you look here in this bright spot here, look at what's happened. Because I wanted to lift the yellows in this mountain, I've also lifted that. So that's gone crazy bright and I've lost all the detail. So now I've got a trade-off. So it may be that I need to make effectively the mountain less yellow and then just use the green slider to make it brighter. Or I've got to do a dodge and burn on the mountain, do it manually, or I've got to do a uh, darken over in the sky over here, or I've got to make the sky less yellow, so it's outside of the scope of black and white. Lots and lots of different ways of doing it, but the fundamental thing is your the black and white conversion tool in Capture One takes what you've done in color and then applies the sensitivity sliders to it. So if you do something in color, it will affect the output in the black and white. It's not just a, it's not a single tool. You're also, you're compounding that on top of all the other stuff you've done before. Okay, uh, next image. Let's go on to one. And it's Carla, who's online. Cool. Um, Carla, uh, sorry, I'm going to go back reverse tim question uh so what will split tones do to this image split tones is about output rather than input so if i go sorry let's go back to bobs here so split tones is about layering effectively color onto the output rather than the input so if i change my shadows to be nice and blue and saturate those and my highlights to be warm i get a split tone output so this means it's not black and white, it's, it's duotone, I guess. It's not monochrome anymore, it's duotone. So I've got a different output color, and it's literally color, to the highlights and to the shadows based on the black and white conversion. But split tones is effectively the icing on the cake if you choose to use it. Um, so you've got color sensitivity, which is taking what you've got underlying and then converting it into the form of black and white you want. Split Tones is then taking in the black and white and then forcing it to have different colors for the highlights and different colors for the shadows. Or turn both of those dials down and you're back to monochrome. You know it's monochrome because all of those sliders, all of those numbers up the top match. Okay. Um, Paul, if I would use Silver FX Pro, so Silver FX, the Nick DXO um, plugin, should I consider the underlying edit in the same way as doing the conversion in Capture One? Yeah, really. I mean, the edit will affect how Silver FX um, interprets it. Now, Silver FX has its own controls of how to uh, interpret colors and channels and so on. So I would start with those. But if you need, let's say you can't get the, the blues dark enough, then go back into Capture One make the blues darker or richer or more saturated and then try again in silver effects and you might find um, that it's doing it. Um, Rick, could you also do the revised color edits in a special black and white mask that you can turn on? Or Yes, you can. So if you're worried about changing the underlying image like we've just done there, um, consider going into your image and in here... You're going to click and hold and go to create a new field adjustment layer and make the color changes there. Bear in mind, just one thing, the black and white tool, this actual tool, does not sit on a layer. It's global. All the other tools will sit within the layer. So your color changes, your editors, all that sort of stuff um, will absolutely sit in the layer quite nicely. But the black and white tool is a global thing over the top. Okay, back to Carla. So Carla's question or challenge or frustration, whichever you want to call it, is about white balance or white. So what is white in, in the shot? So we've got some cool pictures here, literally cool pictures of polar bears. There's an epic one somewhere. This actually reflects my nature right now. Good with that. Yes. So the question that Carla had is, how do I know when white is white um, when it comes to these images? And if I take the example here, so we've got one version there, one version there. They are different white balances. They they look different. One looks cooler. One looks pinker. Same here between these two. Um, we've got two different white balances for the same image. So I'm going to ask... <laughs> colors online. I don't trust my eyes seeing magenta or green. Um, okay. 
there's an easy if you've got something that should be white and there's a there's a big asterisk at the end of what I've just said there but should be white then this is very easy to see and I alluded to it in Bob's image just now if I move my mouse over the screen remember that we're seeing the preview output here this little mouse cursor will tell you by these numbers at the top these four numbers so red green blue channel and overall luminosity what's underneath it and if something is genuinely pure white or gray so in other words there's no color to it forget the, the gray one at the end that's this one here is your luminosity the last one that's that's not relevant to us that's just brightness but the other three would all match or they'd be within one of each other let's say that so in this case here, I can see, if even if I didn't see the pictures, by moving my mouse around, 224 red, 229 green, 239 blue. So this is shifted more blue and slightly more green, not so much red. So it's sort of a cyan-y, bluey sort of color to, um, to the white, which makes sense. That's kind of what I can see on the screen. This one over here, 227 red, 230 green. 249 blue so a lot cooler more blue in there and it's, it's actually darker as well so we've got a slight difference in in brightness there but in broad terms that's a good indicator to whether or something or whether or not something is completely balanced on the white so if i clone this variant here and go back into our color tool and choose our automatic white balance picker and pick there what you've got to remember is what Capture One's doing is choosing the pixel underneath the picker and making that white. It's a bit of fuzziness to it, but it's making that pixel white. And everything else then shifts to that relative, or relatively. So if we had to then shift, let's say, the green tint and the to a warmer Kelvin to make that pixel white, it will shift everything else by the same amount. So that's why you get these big swings. If I tell Capture One that the polar bear's fur should be white, interesting. So I promise you I'm clicking. <laughs> um, and it is shifting, but it's not shifting very much. I would expect to see a much more significant change in white balance. Something's odd there, isn't it? There's something very odd. And Michael's called it. There's a shift on the global layer. Yes, there is. So I'm just going to reset the global layer. There we go. Let's go mad then for a second. Good shout, Michael. Um, yeah, there was a shift in the global layer. So even though I was making changes in the background, Carla's got a global layer there which had a custom white balance on it. So let me pick some fur on our friendly polar bear and say this should be white. What's that done? Well, it's made everything else behind a little warmer because it's had to cool down out of the front let's make maybe the the poor area so the the sort of dirty muddy brown part because it's been i guess ravaging other animals um if i make that neutral remember it's not trying to make it white white it's trying to make it gray so it's trying to make it neutral so whether that's gray dark gray light gray white it doesn't matter it's trying to neutralize and you can see the numbers up above so if i make the fur neutral in fact let's make the snow neutral and now move over the fur, we can see there's a big shift to red. 136, 115, 87. Those are the numbers at the top of that screen. If I now tell Capture One, no, 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 make that neutral. Well, what it then does is it makes this match. So 121, 119, 121, roughly the same. It's, it's gray. But up here, well, it's shifted everything else because it shifted that paw to make that gray. It shifted everything else in the image to also make the same change, the same relative difference, which means my snow has now turned to be 211, 227, 255. In other words, massively blue. So in terms of white balance itself, you've got to work out which bit should be white. So the answer to your question, Carla, um, and we'll come on to it in a second in, in detail, is it depends what you think should be white. Because 
how do you make sure something is white with no color cast? Hang your mouse over the area that you believe should be white. And as long as those numbers all line up, like here, so I've just clicked, and I now get 228, 228, 228, 228. Brilliant. My snow there, underneath that pip or dropper or pipette, is absolutely neutral. It is white. Well, it's bright. Let's put it that way. It's not quite white because it's not 255. But the snow elsewhere might not be. So this snow here in the shadow, for example, because we tend to get cooler light in the shadows, as I look down here, we'll see a shift. There we go. 192 blue, 189 green, 189 red. So it's a slight shift to be cooler, slightly blue. Up here, again, even more blue compared to red. 206 red, 215 blue. And it's meant that the polar bear's fur has gone warmer. So 157 blue. 182 green, 188 red, so it's a warmer color to the fur. So it completely depends on what it is you want to be white. Once you've worked that out, then make sure it's white by using the numbers at the top of the screen up here. But everything else, remember, is going to shift in the same way. And the other question you've got to ask yourself is, was the snow actually white? Because remember that when something reflects light, that snow, which is a great reflector of light, is reflecting the color and tone of the light that's around. So if it was sunset, there's a very high chance that the tone of that snow might have gone, I don't know, maybe to sort of there, slightly warm, because we've got soft light, low on the horizon. You know, It might be that if it was midday or a very cold winter's day, it's gone to sort of out here. That could also be correct. So you've got to work out what it is that you think is um, is white and and then use it. I yes, I do. I have seen them. I can show you. Some photographers, including landscape ones, you'll see them out there with one of these. It's a grey card, and what that allows you to do is take a picture with this out the front of the camera. And then when you go into Capture One, I can put my dropper onto this, and this will tell me what should be neutral in that light. And it's going to neutralize it. Now remember, as a landscape photographer, sometimes you don't want to neutralize that light. You actually want it to be warm, golden, cool, harsh, whatever. But that's where, that's really where you've got to sort of get into your head around how do you want the picture to look? Because this is as much about mood as it is about practicality of what should be white. There we go. Um, right. Uh, view on a white border. Sorry, box 88. Yes. So another way. Um, you've got a proofing margin up here. You can turn that on. And if I were to right click, I can switch this to be white, which very <laughs> gotcha here. Careful. It's as white as your monitor is calibrated. So if you don't have a calibration tool and your eyes are a little bit iffy, be careful with it. But if I start playing with white balance and I'm concerned that it's off white, then just put your proofing border on. Um, and this will show you this clearly is more blue than it should be. This is probably about as neutral as it gets. This one is probably a bit too pinky blue. Where's our lazy dude? This one here, probably a bit too pink. So if I were to then choose the white balance there, that's probably a bit too green, I would say. Um, so even though, in theory, look at the numbers at the top, they're all equal, using a white border can sometimes help you just to make a little tweak. And I might want to just go to maybe there just to neutralize it a bit. But there's lots of tools um, to do this with. But in general, um, the biggest thing you've got to work out is what you want to be white. Getting it white, really easy. Um, but remember, it's going to move everything else in the picture along with it. Uh, JD, yeah, I always use Grey Card for studio work. So, yeah, funnily enough, these these always use, they're often used in studios as well as the, the color charts and stuff like that. Um, you can get official ones, you can get cheap ones off of well known multinational, multi billionaire owned uh, shopping sites. Um, but generally speaking, um, it's not a bad investment to put into your bag if you're worried or struggling with white balance out there. Okay, so hopefully, Carla, that answers that question. Uh, today, we're going to probably finish on Ray. Oh, sorry, Georgs. Um, we'll come back to Ray's uh, next time, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, Georg, uh, the question was, what do I think about the edit? 
The edit is fine. I mean, what you've used in here is the Deep Sky tool. So that's one of the built-in style brushes within Capture One. If I go into, oops, sorry, built-in style brushes and go to enhancements, you will find Deep Sky in there. Deep Sky as a tool basically makes the sky more rich, deeper almost. Um, and if I were to turn that off, let me just turn off our proofing layer and go back to dark. Um, so that's without, that's with. It does a good job. What it doesn't do, however, Georg, is improve your masking. And actually, this is really important. And I, I wish more people um, printed because you would see this in a second on a print. Um, the first place you'll see it is in the mask. If I turn on the mask for the Deep Sky tool, I can see that we haven't quite got everywhere around. Now, remember, the style brush is a brush, but you can still use the other tools to fill in the mask on that layer. So once you've started that layer, the, the Deep Sky layer, you can use Gradient Mask on that layer. You can use uh, Luma Range. You can, um, you can Erase. You can Magic Brush and whatever. Because if you don't and you just rely on the brush, I want you to look at something. I'm going to turn off the mask. Look at these little blue areas here. They're not weird cloud things. They're where the mask hasn't touched the rock. And up here, and as I go around, there's loads of them. Um, so the use of the style brush is great, but you need to refine it. One way of refining it, really simple. I can use a magic eraser, for example, on this rock and say, delete anything that's on the rock. And you hopefully saw that, tidy that one up a little bit. Let me just undo. Let's just clone that so we can see before and after. So Magic Eraser on the rock, you see it starts to delete the bits that we don't like. There we go, getting better. And then a Magic Brush and draw across our sky. And that's going to fill in the gaps really nicely. If we're not a fan of some of the decisions that the Magic Brush has made, which sometimes I'm not, um, so that's cleaned that up pretty nicely, Go to a grayscale mask, so either Alt and M, or Option and M, or on your mask tool here, go to Display Grayscale Mask. And we can go to that same tool I used before, Refine Mask, and you'll see it just adds a layer of, of I guess, softening to the application of the mask so you don't notice it's there so much. And now, now there's another... Oh, no, we're good. Okay, I thought there was a Luma range on there, but there's not. But if I look at there with these little patchwork bits through to there, much better. So yes, the edit's fine, Georg. Um, there's no issue with that in, in that sense. And yeah, to Carla's point, you know, Deep Sky is a, is a fantastic brush. If you've, if you've got a sky that's a little bit flat, use Deep Sky and it will bring out all the blues and the whites. It actually makes the whites whiter and the blues deeper. So it's not, be careful if you're on really, really bright highlights in the sky, it's not gonna help you with that. It's gonna push them too bright. But don't forget that when you are doing these masks, you start with a style brush, you're going to leave gaps. You need to finish the masking. And the masking can be done not just with a brush. You can use Magic Brush. You can use Magic Eraser. You can use Gradient Masks, Radial Masks. You can use Luma Ranges to exclude it. It doesn't matter. But get the masking right. Otherwise, we can see that you've done something. And that's, that's a shame. Because the edit on this... It's kind of nice. Quite like it. Um, certainly, if we go, you know, before to after, certainly more vibrant. Does the job. All good. Uh, I said we will uh, come back to rays next week, but this is a fantastic example of how we can play with some styles, which will show you. Um, it maybe it'll be next week, but it may be um, sooner than a month. Um, we're going to cover some of this in terms of how do we make this go or make the most out of the golden glow. I want to show you the before. Um, so it's been significantly enhanced already in a, in a positive way. We've just got to do some work to make it really, um, really work as an image um, rather than just an improvement. One of the things, Ray, is a handy hint, these bits down here, that contrast is drawing your eye to the foreground. If you want to push the eye further out, we need to change the contrast in our subject rather than um, making it get in the way. We'll cover that next time. Um, for those of you that don't know when that is, because nor do I right now. It will be in one, two, 
three and a half weeks time it will be at the end of july but in order to find that stuff out you will be able to do that either by being part of the facebook group so if you go into that group for those of you that are on facebook you will find that we put all the announcements and stuff like that on there um if you're not then go to our website so go to paulreefer.com go to i think from memory it's workshops then live online sessions and you will see a countdown that tells you when the next one is on don't forget please don't forget this is how you send in images and it's how we get hold of them and it's how we're able to use them um, to edit so do please upload those um, we'll be back in a few weeks time but remember if you haven't had enough of capture one stuff we've got all of those live streams coming up including one in two days time on thursday with david that color editor masterclass and the others you will find the link in the description to this video or on that magic learning hub um, that you're now going to all go and check obviously within capture one um, but between now and when i see you next time look after yourselves um, well some of you i'll see you on thursday um, the rest of you will see you probably from the middle of somewhere in a hill or on a rooftop somewhere um, with or without an axe in hand either way right catch you later bye